All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Uh, I'm going to continue in this line um, of talking about Jesus' last week. Today I'm going to talk about conversations that Jesus had that week. I've had people come up to me in the last few weeks uh, since I've begun this, and they have said that the, God has been speaking to them. Isn't it funny how the, the Lord just is by, very good? He's, he knows exactly what we need and can... Uh, he can even th speak through a donkey. He has proven that. And I think that's sometimes the reason why God had called me to preach, was he can show that through the least of these, that the Word of God can come through. I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit can speak. I'm amazed at what God does. And here's the word is, he condescended himself to earth. May we never forget, you listening? That it's the God of eternity who left heaven, the perfection that he had always known for eternity past. And he stepped away from that because there was a reason and a purpose. The Son of God had to come to earth and be born as man, the Son of Man, so that he could uh, make a way. Before he came, he knew the cross would come. He knew it was there. And it was worth it to him. Everything that he went through was for us. The line in the song that we sang this morning was, he didn't want heaven without us. So he came for us, provided a way. But here's the thing. The God of heaven, the God of all good, who knows nothing except that which is honoring and blessing. What did he receive when he came down here? What did he have to put up with? Us. The ones that he came to. We were his purpose. We were his life. We were everything that was good. He wanted us with him. So today we're going to look at some of the conversations that Jesus had. Some of them were great conversations with good people. Sometimes he was confronted with people who had evil intent. These people, just like you and I today, are the reason Jesus left. We are the objects of his love. One of the people that's blessed my life very much is a man by the name of Dr. Henry Cloud. He's a Christian psychologist. He and uh, John Townsend have written many books together. I think probably his biggest seller is the one called Boundaries. By the way, it's a great book. A lot of us live life without boundaries, and if we live life without boundaries, anything and everything can come into our life. There is a, 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 an area where we need to say, uh, I'm not going to let that into my life. We, I'm not going to let that evil in. I'm not going to let that influence in. It, it's, it's a great, great book. And he is an accomplished psychologist. But he, he's written a book called Necessary Endings. And in this book, uh, by the way, I want to make sure that if I get anything that I, I make sure that everybody knows where I get that information from. All right. I'm going to footnote my sermons. I think that's the way you're supposed to. That's the way I was taught to. I don't want anybody to think if I come up with this stuff, oh, Preacher Brian's smart. No, I just know some smart people. Amen? At least I can read their book. Now, Henry Cloud wrote this book, Necessary Endings, and in this book, he says that there are three types of people. He says that there are wise people, there are foolish people, and there are evil people. Now, can I just say that that's hard? It's hard for me to swallow that. It's hard for me to say that there are evil people in the world. I know that there's some wise people. I have been a foolish person. I understand that. But to say that there's evil, and yet we know that there is. And when I begin to really look at Jesus' last week. Most of those, 
You know, by the way, most of the Gospels are about that last week. And most of those times are about him talking with people, teaching parables, trying to show them what was coming next, lead them about the cross, the picture of the cross, and the resurrection on the other side of it. But when I started to look at these, I noticed again and again and again conversations that Jesus had. And some people were wise. Some were not. They were foolish. But the sad thing is, is that some were just flat out evil. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you treasure, your heart will follow. So be careful what you treasure. As a matter of fact, your heart is a good picture of what you will treasure. If you treasure money, that's where your heart's going to be. If you treasure popularity, that's where your heart's going to be, wanting that. Notoriety, whatever it may be. So in these conversations that Jesus had, there will be expressed what they treasured, what they valued, what these people were living for. Some of the people were pointing out to Jesus, look at the temple, what a magnificent building it was. Jesus said, tear it down, I'll rebuild it in three days. He wasn't talking about the walls, he was talking about his body, the temple of the Lord. And by the way, that, those, that beautiful temple that took 70 years to build was torn down by Rome in A.D. 70. They valued it. It became nothing. If you went to Jerusalem today, you would find one wall, the Wailing Wall, that's left from back then. The rest of it is gone. Riches. One of the things that you're going to find in Jesus' last week, the high priest was named Caiaphas. His, or, or excuse me, yeah, Caiaphas, his uh, father was Annas, who was the high priest. Now, remember when we talked about uh, last Sunday about the the the, the temple and, and the the all the uh, uh, the the money changers and the 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 sheep and the and, and the cattle and the doves that were out there in the Gentile court. You know who made money from that? Historians tell us that it was the family of Annas, the former high priest. So when Jesus was in there kicking over those tables where all that money was, who was losing money? Annas. So he was the one that was leading out against Jesus. And as a matter of fact, when Jesus was taken by the soldiers in the Garden of Gethsemane, they were led to Annas' house where everybody was there so they could judge him at night. By the way, there were supposed to be no trials at night. But they did. Evil intent. Money. Some people looked at the temple. Some people looked at positions. Some people said, look at authority. In Matthew 21, verse number 23, Hear this conversation. When he, that is Jesus, came into the temple, the chief priests, the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching. They interrupted him. They waited for a time where they could ask a question. And this is what they asked. By what authority are you doing these things? What things? Healing people? Helping people? Teaching Scripture. Matter of fact, when people heard him teach Scripture, the Bible tells us they were amazed at what authority he had. He was just teaching the Scripture. But listen, when the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will add the power of the Word of God uh, uh, upon our lives. It's God's authority. 
Some people think that it's how talented the preacher is. God forbid. It has nothing to do with the preacher or really his style of delivery. Nothing at all. If there's anything beneficial, it's when the holy God hears the word of God and sends the power of God to come into our lives and our hearts. I learned a long time ago, sometimes people will come and they'll give me a compliment, but I don't take that because I'm, I want to deflect that. I, I'm not trying to be rude, but I know who they're trying to compliment. It's God, not me. You don't. I don't want, I don't want to steal God's glory. And God's not here to highlight me. He's here to highlight the glory and the truth and the, and the power of God in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Never confuse the two. So they're asking, by what authority are you speaking these things? Literally, it's because they didn't have that authority. <laughs> they didn't have that power. And he says here in the end of verse 23, and who gave you this authority? Now he could have, Nailed them right then and said, it's the power of God that in which I speak, the power of God that you don't have. But that would have been in the wrong tone. So Jesus asked him a question. He says, well, let me ask you, John's Baptist, John the Baptism, was he from God or was he of man? Oh, they had to think about that. Listen, listen to what that they said about that. Um, in verse 25, he said, they reason among themselves saying, if we say it's from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we, we fear the multitude for all count John as a prophet. You know what they were doing? They, they were trying to figure out how they could, they could twist it. Y'all look up here. The word of God never needs to be twisted. Truth doesn't need any help. You know, y'all know what a plumb line is? You got a string with a weight on it and you hold it up and it'll tell you what is absolutely purely north south. It will tell you what is plumb. You don't need to grab it and move it over. Now your head might be turned and you say, no, 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 I need to move it a little bit over here. Like me playing with the earth over here. I think somebody's moving it when I'm not looking. What do y'all think? I think it's that hurricane. There's a hurricane out in the Atlantic and it keeps blowing the world around. Look, the plumb line doesn't need my help. I don't adjust it to me. I just adjust me to the plumb line. The truth is the truth. It will always be the truth. Nothing but the truth. Now, he goes on in uh, Matthew 21, and he shares two parables with them. But I want you to hear their reaction to the parables. Look, at, Listen in verse 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Now he's talking about they're rejecting him, but Jesus himself is the cornerstone, uh, the one upon which the whole building stands. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. That was me. I fell on it. I was broken, but I was also healed by the power of God. But on whomever it falls... It will grind him to power. Verse 45, this is very important. When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard the, his parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. And when they sought to lay hands on him, they got so mad because he was preaching the word of God. He was quoting scripture to them. And they knew that he was talking about them. So instead of listening to the truth, they rejected it, and they got so mad that they were going to lay hands on him, they were going to hurt him. Something in that human flesh of anger came out. But they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Look in chapter 22. Look down in verse 15. Another parable has gone on. Verse 15 says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. They're going to trip Jesus up. <laughs> yeah, good luck. 
Verse 16, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. The Herodians were a group of people. We would, we would say they, were, they, they went to law school. They, they're, they're like this uh, Harvard graduate uh, attorney, or maybe a whole lot better than Harvard. I don't know. But they, they, the, the disciples with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true. Oh, they're buttering him up. They're, 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 they're setting a trap. You teach the ways of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the persons of men. They're setting him up. Verse 17, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You're not going to trap Jesus. Jesus just came in there and said in verse 21, he said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Verse 22, when they heard these things, they marveled and left him and went away. This group of people, now there's different groups that he's going to meet, but this group of people that day, they heard his teaching, and when they heard the power of the words, they went, wow. And they went away. Hold on here. When you hear the truth of God, listen now, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on it, I can talk to your ears, but God talks to your heart. Amen? Amen? Now, when you marvel at what God is saying in your heart, when the Holy Spirit is coming and amening truth to you, it is your privilege. It is your privilege to be amazed at the wonderful words of Christ. The blessings, how great it is. But they marveled and went away. Wouldn't it have been better if they marveled and stayed and was changed? Let's keep going. Look in verse number 23 there, chapter 22. The same day the Sadducees, a different group, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him. Basically, they're setting him up as well, and they're going to ask him about uh, something, and Jesus knows who they are, and he answers them. But look what it says in verse 33. When the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And when the Pharisees heard that he silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Verse 34. And in verse 35 it says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? All right. I, the answer is right there, but I want to give you the answer as it's recorded in the good news of Mark. All right, so turn over to the Gospel of Mark Chapter number 12. We're going to look at verse number 29. Here's the answer to that question. What's the first commandment? What's the greatest commandment of all? Here's the answer. Jesus said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now this is Deut Deuteronomy chapter 6. We've studied it. It's the Shema. Amen. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. But then he goes on. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And God's people said, that's good stuff. Love God. Do it with all your heart, not part. I mean, if he's worth it, he's worth it all. Amen? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your thinking, all your strength, yield it all to him. You stay under the umbrella of God's perfection and you're good. Amen? I like that. Verse 32. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God. And there is no other but He. And to love Him and all the 
uh, with all the heart, with understanding and the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as ourself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. <laughs> Jesus likes this. Look at verse 34. Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, and he said to him, hey, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Hey, guy, you're getting it. Amen. You can, you're, you're close. But close won't get you into heaven. We still need to change. We still need to change. Matter of fact, uh, this is not a conversation, but I wanted to, to really highlight this. Uh, we, we don't talk about this lady enough. Jesus was in the temple. He looks over and sees a woman. And this woman amazed him. When Jesus taught, others were amazed. When this woman lived her life, it amazed Jesus. Look what it says in verse 41. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money in the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, he, he wants them to catch it. It's almost like Jesus to the disciples said, did you see that? Did you see that? Look what it says. Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Now this is Holy Week. People are coming from all over the world. And all these people coming to bring their tithe. Maybe it's their yearly tithe. But Jesus said, did you see that? This woman gave more than all. <laughs> wow. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. And to that, God's people said, Amen. wow, what a woman. I know right now what she's wearing. The regal robes of glory. I know exactly what she has inherited now. The very best of God. This woman's not a poor widow anymore. She's a child of the King. She has the one who had the very least now has the most. I call that a wise woman. Henry Cloud said that there are three groups of people. There are wise people, foolish people, and evil people. Let's talk about the wise people. These are the ones who encounter the truth, and when they see the truth, they change as a result. They see truth. They hear truth. They know truth. Maybe they're astonished by it. Maybe they're marveled by it. But they change. Hold on. Remember the plumb line? Did y'all see it up here? Was it straight? When they see the truth, they get a reflection back upon themselves. This is true, and I'm not meeting that standard. So what they do is they change to Christ. They change to truth. That's a pretty good place to be. Amen? If I'm with Christ, I'm in good, uh, the old people used to say, high cotton. I'm in high cotton. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Amen? That, that, that'll preach right there. That's mountaintop. That's a life full of joy and peace and love and goodness. That's a good place to be. A matter of fact, is that not a good place like heaven's going to be? You better believe it. You better believe it. 
Well, then there's foolish people. These are the people that encounter truth, but they don't change. They stay broke. Matter of fact, let me go a little further. What they try to do is try to adjust the truth to fit them. Here's the plumb line. Y'all see it? Here's their life. So what they try to do, instead of coming up and changing to the truth, they try to get the truth to change to them. They want to adjust the truth to fit them. That's called foolish. They don't admit they're wrong. They don't admit their need. So they try to change the truth. But ch truth never changes. So what they do is they deny it. Or they'll blame a situation. They'll minimize it. Oh, that's no big deal. That was just a little white lie. I just, you know, I took what belonged to me. No, you didn't. You stole. You call it whatever. Well, they cheated me. You stole. Well, I deserve that. You stole. It is what it is. But they want to blame somebody else. Well, you don't know what they said to me. That gave me the right to punch them. Talk to Christ about that. When they whipped him and they beat him and they pulled out his beard and they spit in his face. And he never said a word. Truth is truth. Yeah, but you, you don't understand, preacher. And they'll make excuses. That's foolish. They're confronted with truth but they don't change the truth. They want truth to change to them. They never learn and they rarely grow. And then there's the evil people. It's evil. I, I tell you, this is hard to admit. But in our life, we've all been wise and we've all been foolish. But there's been some times in our life we've just been evil. This is when we encounter truth and we just reject it. We just reject it. And we'll do anything not to change. They attack the truth and they'll attack the messenger of truth. And they just don't care. And they don't care who they hurt. You're just a casualty in their life. They're like the hurricane that comes blowing through. And they really just don't care. They in, intend to step on you. They intend to harm you. Listen now. So they can win. They can win. Y'all never hear me talk much about politics. But I want to tell you, politics have gotten evil in our country. Evil. Because the only thing they care about is they win. And it's not just that they win, the other side has to lose. And where they come up on a situation has nothing to do with truth. It's what they've already decided beforehand. And they're going to give their full allegiance to a party's policies or their strength or their authority or their position of power or their how they have money rather than what is best for our country. And by the way, I'm not pointing fingers at one side or the other because I think they're both polluted. Both. And who's paying the cost? We're the ones in the wake of the hurricane. They don't care. They twist any truth these evil people do. And just reject it altogether just to get their way. It's a grab. And they'll take any grain of what they think is a, a half truth and they'll stand on that. Let me ask y'all something. Isn't a half truth a full lie? It's either the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, or it's a lie. 
Correct? There's only one plumb line. I don't care how close you are to it. If it's off, it's off. Hold on. We judge, oh, I'm talking to all of us. We judge our walk with God and we say, I may not be like so-and-so, but at least I'm not like them. And what we do is we say, I'm bad, but at least I'm not that bad. And we make ourselves feel better, or we try to make ourselves feel better. And if you're not careful, when you reject the truth and have no desire to change to the truth, that is classified as evil. What makes this hard is I've seen evil in my life. There's some things in my life that I've been changing or trying to change for, how old am I, 61, 55, 56 of those years? How many of y'all come up and, and battle the same things over and over? Have you ever tried to figure out why? Change is a process. I understand that. And change can be slow. But change comes from God. Jesus said, I am the way, not one of many ways. I am the, say it loud, church. Yes, and the definite article is there. He is not saying, I'm one of many truths. He says, I am the truth. And I am the life. He is the way, there's no other way. He is the truth, there is no other truth other than what is found in him. He is the life, and people who reject him will receive non-life away from God's glory, away from his goodness, away from his blessings, away from his grace, away from his mercy forever. God doesn't send anyone to outer darkness. You choose that when you reject the truth. Why would anyone reject someone whose sole purpose, who has all the power of all of heaven, has, his sole purpose is to bless you. But you reject that because you've got a different truth, a different understanding, a different way. How's that working for you? What happens to people? They get stuck. So let me share a few quick things. Y'all with me so far? When people get stuck, they need to be seen with fresh eyes. How many of you like being judged by your worst day? How many of you know that there are things that will happen in our life that will cast a shadow over the remainder of our days? By the way, sometimes it's not really anything that you've done, but it's what someone said that you've done. So you believe that about them, and you're going to judge them for that the remainder of their days. When Jesus met these people that last week, he met some wise people, and he blessed them. He met some foolish people, and he tried to correct them. He met some evil people, and he endured them. But he looked at him with fresh eyes because God never gives up on anybody. Y'all hear me? God doesn't give up on anybody. Let me talk to you about Judas. When Jesus called him, he gave him an opportunity, didn't he? He knew he would betray him, didn't he? Yet he never treated him any differently than the other, other 11 in the group. He never rolled his eyes at him. You know, when he looked at him, and he went, there he is again. Thief. No. Praise God that when God looks at us, it doesn't matter if you failed the second chance and the 22nd chance and the 5,000th chance. With God, he is here to bless you with a fresh start. He looks at you with fresh eyes. And by the way, so should we with everyone around us. Is there anybody you haven't loved and forgiven? If you haven't forgiven them, you need to look at them with fresh eyes. Number two, be patient. Jesus was patient. God is patient with us. God is a God of grace. 
And God wants to see us change. And maybe some other people haven't changed yet. You be, you be patient with them because God's working on them. But hold on. In your life, don't procrastinate. If God has revealed himself to you, remember I told you last week, I said at the very beginning of my sermon last week, I said, if God tells you anything, make up your mind that you're going to do it. Don't argue with him. Don't delay it. Don't procrastinate. I mean, if it's God, you, you can trust him. Amen? If there's something that God's saying in your life you need to do, do it today. Number three, let others speak life into you. How many of you know that you don't see yourself the way others see you? Sometimes those closest to you can see your picadillos and your flaws, right? And the greatest thing that they could do is come up and hold up a mirror to you so that you can see yourself for what you really are. Praise God for friends. I hope you're listening to me. Are y'all listening? There's nobody in this room that doesn't need to be discipled. If you're not in a group of people where you're helping disciple others and you're letting others disciple you, you're shortchanging yourself. If you've gotten to a place where you say, I got it, I don't need to do that, I'm good, I'm good, bless you. You're not as good as you think. Listen to the whisper of God in your heart. Listen to the whisper of God. Eternity can be changed in a moment. God can do more in a moment than you can do in all of your life or you can do in 10 generations of your family. God can do more in a moment if you'll let him. Be accepting of truth. Don't reject truth don't reject the savior accept his salvation receive his love let him bless why would you turn from one who wants to be there to aid you and help you and to lift you up when you're weak i wish I could open my heart and let you look in. You would not see someone perfect, but you would see someone made perfect by Christ. You would see not someone good, but you would see the good of Christ in me. You would not see the smartest. You would not see the most beautiful. You would not see the wisest. You would not see any of those things at all. But you could see someone, listen to me, that's satisfied. I am satisfied with Jesus because He has changed me I love this word. I can't get over this word. To the uttermost. Beyond what I could comprehend. That's how good our God is. Would you receive that today? From the hand of the Almighty.